everyone and welcome. Sorry. Good afternoon and welcome to today's seminar. Um, I'm Jennifer Zaratka. I'm working on my PhD with Dr. Carol Chambers studying an endangered jumpy mouse. Um, our work includes collaboration with the Southern Ute Indian tribe in Southwestern Colorado. I think um, Steve Whiteman and Aaron Johnson who had that up are here um, to join us as well. We also work with the White Mountain Apache in Arizona. So this topic today is especially meaningful for me. I'm excited and honored to introduce Dr. Julie Thorstenson. Julie is currently the executive director of the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. And one of, one of those colleagues with the Southern Ute shared that Julie has really propelled the organization forward in her tenure. She grew up on a cattle ranch on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in North Central South Dakota, where a love of the land and the environment was instilled in her. Dr. Thorstenson earned a BS, MS, and PhD in biological sciences from South Dakota State University. Her research is focused on cottonwood site selection using GIS for riparian restoration and incorporating culture into ethics education for scientists and engineers. Julie has worked in Indian country her entire career in various positions, including wildlife habitat biologist and health department CEO for her tribe. She currently lives on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in South Dakota with her husband and three children. Julie will now introduce herself in Lakota and then tell us today about tribal wildlife management and the many ways tribes are doing converse conservation. Please welcome Dr. Julie Thorstenston. Hello, Julie Thorstenson and Machiapi. Oksapi ki gluhamini me on Lakota Machiapi. Me Lakota, Wakpa washte in Taha. Daya hiye. Itancha Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Thorstenson. Uh, my Lakota name is She Carries Her Wisdom With Her. I am a citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux Nation in North Central South Dakota, and I am Lakota. I'm also the executive director for the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. And I'm just really happy to be here. And I wanna thank you all for taking time out of your day to, to join me and listen to me. Um, I hope you're not anticipating lots of forestry stories because I am a Plains Indian. So we don't have too many, too many forests, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, make sure everything's working here. Another way to monitor. There we go. So as Jen said, I grew up in my homelands with uh, my, four, my four siblings and they're in the bottom right hand corner there with my, my parents. And uh, I spent a lot of time on the back of a horse helping my family on our cow calf operation. And it was really these hours that we spent, you know, playing in the playing outside and, and climbing trees and playing in the river, um, fishing and just being outside in the environment that that led me to a natural resource career. And I guess it was really kind of the land and, and my family that led me back home. And my husband and I moved home in 2000 after I finished my bachelor's degree. And we've, uh, we've worked here and raised our family ever since. So I started my career in wildlife in 2000 as my tribe's first wildlife habitat biologist. And the picture on the left is my sister and I, we were both wildlife biologists and um, we're drawing blood with our, one of our wildlife techs who incidentally is now one of the tribal councilmen. Uh, we're drawing blood for a turkey transplant project that we worked on through the National Wild Turkey Federation and uh, Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. And it was really during my time working for my tribe's game fish and parks department that I became involved with uh, the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. First as a member, um, later as a presenter, and finally as a Great Plains Regional Director and a member of the board of directors from 2007 to 2009. I took a little detour from natural resources. I worked in academics, healthcare, but eventually I found my way back to my true passion, which is fish and wildlife. And I'm even more blessed to work in Indian country. Uh, I get to learn and advocate for so many diverse tribes and people. And you know, prior to pandemic, I traveled a lot, which are some of these pictures. Um, the top left one is when I visited the Quinina tribe and Martha's Vineyard. Um, and then of course, the middle one is from the um, Greece, Battle of Greasy, greasy flat or greasy grass, sorry, um, our little big horn. And then the top right is um, I think Massachusetts. So, um, you know, I travel a lot and I'm just constantly amazed at all the great work that's being done by tribal fish and wildlife professionals. 
And I'm mind, reminded daily how diverse and rich in, in knowledge Indigenous people truly are. I'm also really fortunate to work with an extremely talented group. And I wanna give a shout out to our staff. We've grown when I started, there were two and a half of us. And now we are um, about nine and growing. And the staff consists of Ashley Carlisle, our education coordinator. And, and this is after our national conference. So that's why we look, we're just like kind of celebrating getting through it in a pandemic. Uh, Ashley is Danae. And next is uh, Heidi McCann. She's our office manager and our membership coordinator. And she's Yavapai Apache. Corey Lucero is one of our fish and wildlife biologists um, and SACs. Sac and Fox Nation, and then Sean Cross grew up, he's one of our other fish and wildlife biologists, and he grew up um, on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Robert Romero is our conservation law enforcement officer consultant, and he's a citizen of Pueblo of Laguna. April Richards joined us in September as our public information officer. Shaylin Miller in the top left just joined us as our wildlife connectivity coordinator, and she's a citizen of the Chippewa Cree of Rocky Boys in Montana. And finally, Laurel James in the top right-hand corner is our director of programs. She just started um, last week, I think, <laughs> and she's a citizen of Yakima Nation. So I wanna start by just kind of introducing you to the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. We are a nonprofit organization with the mission to assist Native American and Alaska Native tribes with the conservation, protection, enhancement of their wildlife resources. We have uh, the purposes of um, charitable, scientific, educational, and cultural services. And we provide mechanisms for information and public networking through conferences, training symposiums, uh, instructive professional and youth practicums, technical services, and administrative council support. This is a picture from our summer youth practicum with our kids this past, uh, past uh, July. We are a membership organization and we have seven regions with 227 support member tribes. So that means that we have 227 individual tribes that have expressed their support of the work we do through a tribal resolution. Uh, we take this really seriously and we wanna make sure that we're advocating and serving each of our member tribes respectfully and individually. And I find that uh, an increase in effort to be inclusive of tribes there's still a misunderstanding of the diversity that is within Indian country. We also have individual memberships um, and most of our members are native people who work in fish and wildlife or natural resources in Indian country. Uh, our members include conservation officers, biologists, wildlife and fisheries technicians, program administrators. Uh, our members come from tribal, federal, state, NGOs, private, and we have student members. So basically anyone that shares our member is welcome, or shares our mission is welcome to become a member. And this is just a map of our seven regions. So now to truly understand tribal lands and their management, you have to have some level of understanding of the history. So I unfortunately cannot explain, um, possibly explain it all in 15, 45 minutes. So I'm gonna give you a condensed version or cliff notes, uh, if you please. So I think you probably all know that it started with one lost Italian and his discovery of what indigenous people would refer to as their home. And this led to hundreds of years of encroachment and varying levels of conflict, sometimes fighting together, sometimes fighting each other, uh, and the loss of countless indigenous people through disease, starvation, slavery, and ultimately genocide. And it's interesting enough, a lot of times that genocide was, um, it was accomplished through fish and wildlife as, uh, as many of you know, the native people are so tied to it as their first foods. The buffalo is a, is a primary example. So continuing on, once the United States was officially formed, they had to decide what to do with indigenous people. They recognized tribes as sovereign entities. Tribal sovereignty means tribes have the inherent right to govern themselves. And this relationship led to treaties between tribal nations and the United States. The first treaty between the US and an American tribe was in eight, or 1778 with the Delaware. The, and then the thirst for more land and conquering and owning gave us a westward expansion and good old Lewis and Clark and the Louisiana Purchase. And under President Andrew Jackson, we got the Indian Removal Act and the Trail of Tears amongst others. So since the US was removing indigenous people from the Eastern homelands, uh, they needed a place to put them, which gave us the reservation era uh, between 1850 and 1887. I'm Lakota, so I'm most familiar with my tribe's history. 
the map on the left is South Dakota and what was promised in the 1868 uh, Fort Laramie Treaty to the Great Sioux Nation and included pretty much uh, all of Western South Dakota. And as you can see, that didn't last long with the discovery of gold and, and again, the US thirst for land and ownership. And much of this occurred during the assimilation era are as Captain Richard Pratt so infamously stated, kill the Indian, save the man. And the picture on the right uh, captures this with three Lakota boys and, and the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Um, the US next attack was to terminate their federal obligation to tribes. And this was mainly through the BIA relocation program, our actual termination of some tribes and extending state jurisdiction into Indian country through public law uh, 280. So between 1954 and 1964, over 100 tribes were terminated and over a million acres of land were removed from trust status. So by 1960, over 33,000 American Indian Alaska Native people have been relocated. So just to recap from your 500 years and five minute history lesson, tribes have lost parts or all of their culture, language. It was estimated that there were over 500 languages spoken in North America pre-European contact. It's also estimated that 10 million indigenous people occupied North America pre-European contact. And the American Indian Alaska Native population in the United States as of 2020 is estimated around 6.79 million. And then we have a slug of treaties, 367 to be exact, between 1778 and 1868. And they are not all the same. And land. And although indigenous people don't be, didn't believe in owning the land, they still lost about 1.5 billion acres of their homelands. And to help visualize this, hopefully I don't mess this up. Um, to help visualize this, I wanna show a short clip. Hopefully I can do it right. <clears throat> okay, hopefully that worked. <laughs> Whoops. Hold on, now I got to get back out of this and get back into the next one. <clears throat> Continuing on. So I have to tell you, my entire career has been working in Indian country, um, mainly in the Great Plains and, and some in the Southwest. And I'm a student and I'm always learning about the differences amongst tribes. Alaska joined the United States in 1959 at the height of the termination era in Indian country. And they are very unique, so much so that the government has an entire course on how to work with Alaska natives, which, which I have taken. There are 229 Alaska Native tribes and villages, and they differ from the lower 48 in their relationship with the United States. They have very little actual land ownership and only one reservation, the Net Island Reserve. They do not have treaties, but have the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971. ANSCA was a new approach by Congress to federal Indian policy. It extinguished Aboriginal land title in Alaska 
and then divided the state into 12 district regions and mandated the creation of 12 private for-profit Alaska Native Regional Corporations and over 200 private for-profit Alaska Native Village Corporations. It also mandated that both regional and village corporations be owned by enrolled Alaska Native shareholders. So another important piece of legislation for Alaska Natives is the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act or ANILCA Section 8, which deals with subsistence uses by rural residents of Alaska, including natives and non-natives. And that is a very short and oversimplified version of Alaska Natives land and their management. And I am not an expert by any means. And so I'm going to primarily continue my talk focusing on the lower 48. But I do encourage you to take a look at Alaska and, and, and Angska and Anilka for further um, research and information. So I'm gonna shift my focus now to tribal lands and management of fish and wildlife and natural resources. It's important to note that uh, indigenous people have been managing or stewarding or coexisting with fish and wildlife and natural resources for thousands of years in order to survive. The Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 under President Franklin D. Roosevelt and hailed as the, the Indian New Deal promoted the exercising of tribal self-governing powers. Many tribes organized I, under IRA and developed constitutions and tribal governments based on the US system. The Pittman-Robertson, our federal aid, and Wildlife Restoration Act was passed in 1937. And this created an ex excise tax that provides funds to each state to manage their, their wildlife and their habitats. So anytime you buy a gun or shells, et cetera, that tax goes to the state for this purpose. The Dingle Johnson Act or the Federal Aid and Sports fish, fish Restoration was passed in 1950 and created an excise tax on fishing rods, reels, lures, et cetera, to provide funds for state fish restoration and management. It would really be impossible to, for me to list every case that has impacted tribal management of land and natural resources. So I'm gonna talk about just a couple. Uh, an important act in Indian country is Public Law 93-638, the Indian Self-Determination Education Assistance Act of 1975. This allowed tribes to contract many services the federal government provide um, under their trust responsibilities tribes. Originally, Public Law 93-638 only applied to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Indian Health Service, but was expanded to more agencies under the Department of Interior in 1994. And you will hear tribes talk about 638ing or 638 contracting, and many tribes have contracted their health programs, education, law enforcement, and natural resources from the federal government through the BIA, our Indian Health Service, and many tribal fish and wildlife programs are 638 programs. As tribes exercise more sovereignty and self-governance, more conflict arose, especially with states. The picture on the left is an elk taken from the White Mountain Apache tribe. And as you can see, this is a trophy animal and the White Mountain Apache tribe are world renowned for their trophy elk. The White Mountain Apache versus the state of Arizona Department of Game and Fish and Confederated Tribes of the Colville Indian Reservation versus the state of Washington and Ralph Larson of state of Washington Department of Game. This case dealt with the tribes managing their hunting and fishing. Tribes were marketing to non-Indian sportsmen the opportunity to hunt and fish on their reservations in Arizona and Washington. They had hunting and fishing codes and were selling hunting and fishing licenses. The states argued that tribes did not have jurisdiction over non-Indians. And basically the result of this case reaffirmed that tribes do have jurisdiction over their fish and wildlife. The US Supreme Court case of New Mexico versus Mescalero Apache tribe in 1983 was similar challenging the tribe's jurisdiction over on-reservation hunting and fishing. The tribe won and affirmed the jurisdiction of hunting and fishing on reservation, stating the exercise of concurrent jurisdiction by the state would effectively nullify the tribe's unquestioned authority to regulate the use of its resources by members and non-members and would interfere with the comprehensive tribal regulatory scheme and would threaten Congress's overriding objective of encouraging tribal self-government and economic development. <clears throat> So the White Mountain, Colville, and Mescalero cases are especially important to the NAFWS as they served as a catalyst for our founders. One of our founders, Gerald Buzz Cabell Blackfeet, uh, stated that in 1980, tribes rallied to respond to proposed national fish hatchery closures that would negatively impact tribal fisheries nationwide. There was a tribal funding and, and funding, tribal funding and fishery rights workshop held in Seattle in 1980, and later that year, a meeting in Gallup, New Mexico. Here, tribal fish and wildlife professionals began to recognize the need for an organization to bring them all together to establish a stronger national voice. 
And this group created the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society in 1982, and then hosted their first national meeting in Phoenix, Arizona, which was co-hosted by the White Mountain Apache Tribe and the Mescalero Apache Tribe. And later that year, NAFWS was officially incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit organization in Colorado. So now that you have a basic understanding of the history of tribes and NAFWS, let's get into what we're here for. So like I said, I'm going to focus on tribal fish and manage, management of fish and wildlife and natural resources. And as I said, I am a Plains native and admittedly my experience with forestry is limited. So I, um, I'm going to try to share some of what my staff has shared with me. And I'm going to cover the following, funding, staffing, diversity, organizations, the influence tribes have in our future. So funding is and has been one of the number one issues in tribal fish and wildlife management, mainly the lack of really the inequity in funding for tribal fish and wildlife programs is perhaps one of the most obvious but least known issues in conservation work. I mentioned Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson funds earlier. And if you recall, they were passed in 1937 and 1950 and they do not include tribes. Tribes have tried numerous times to amend these acts unsuccessfully. And it's important to note that tribal members are not exempt from paying these excise taxes and tribal lands and tribal populations are used to calculate the state distribution. In fiscal year 2021, the lower 48 states received uh, a total of a, a little over a, a billion dollars of PRDJ funds and tribal lands account for about 3.65% of the lower 48 states land base. And this equates to about $37 million of the fiscal 21 Pittman Robertson Dingle Johnson funds, which tribes receive no dollars. The 638 contracts provide base funding for some tribes, but it's inadequate and hasn't had a substantial increase really ever. So a contract entered into in 1980 has roughly the same amount of funding in 2022. And fortunately, as we know, costs have gone up despite the lack of funding. One of the successes of tribes and states attempts at increasing funding for fish and wildlife was the creation of the state and tribal wildlife grants or, or TWIG. And I'll talk about these more in the next slide. Tribes also use hunting and fishing license revenue to fund their programs. However, this varies greatly based on those resources, the access accessibility, marketing, and the tribe's overall views on management. And additionally, it seems tribes are not relying on our managing fish and wildlife resources for outside revenue, but more for tribal member use and subsistence. Some tribes supplement their programs with other tribal funds, such as land lease or casino revenue, but again, that varies by tribe. And tribes rely on grants from federal agencies, NGOs, and nonprofits. In a recent survey conducted by NAFWS, we found 83% of tribes were, we surveyed in the lower 48 states reported fed, receiving federal grants. And most of the time, these funds are for projects and not the overall operation and maintenance of their program. So the state and tribal wildlife program, grant programs are managed through the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and they've been around for 20 years. And while it was a victory for tribes to be included in the funding, it is important to look at how tribes are included. The state wildlife grant program was established in 2000. It authorized formula-based funding for states, territories, and commonwealth and the District of Columbia based on land size and population. In addition, the, comp the competitive state wildlife grant program was created by Congress in 2007 with funds distributed through competitive awards to states, territories, and DC. The maximum grant award under the competitive state wildlife grant is $1 million. In 20 years, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has awarded about $1.2 billion to states, territories, and DC through this, the state wildlife grant formula and competitive grants. The tribal wildlife grant program was established in 2001 with funds distributed through a competitive award process to federally recognized tribes. The maximum award amount is $200,000. Since 2002, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has awarded $105.6 million to tribes through the tribal wildlife grant providing support for 593 projects in Indian country. Now, I don't really intend for this slide to downplay the importance of both programs. However, I've never really understood why 574 tribes must compete for these funds. Also, TWIG is funded at a significantly less amount, historically around $5.5 million per year, a funding level of around $10,000 per 574 federally recognized tribe per year. However, since these are competitive grant projects, that the fish and wildlife states only about 25% are funded, we can assume that there's at least an unmet annual need of, of around 16.5 million for tribal fish and wildlife funding are around 83 proposals. This number also does not take into consideration that there are many tribes that do not have the capacity to even apply for this funding. 
When I started as the executive director of NAFWS in 2019, the first thing I did was start calling tribal fish and wildlife programs and ask them what their top concerns were. Overwhelmingly, it was funding and staffing, which I'm sure you can understand, you can't have staffing without adequate funding. The type of funding also impacts staffing. If you have a grant for a project with a total award amount of 200,000 and you wanna build, build staffing capacity, it presents a problem. As an example, a tribe may have a very valid potential project, but with staff limited to one or two individuals taking the time to write a proposal, and if awarded, managing a grant takes away from other important work. So this can be seen as more trouble than it's worth. Tribal fish and wildlife programs are so unique based on many factors. Our smallest program has a half-time employee. So basically a law enforcement person housed within the tribal police department, but also responsible for conservation enforcement. If you don't have adequate funding to hire more professional staff, you also don't have the capacity to hustle for those competitive funds. If you lack annual sustainable funding, which most tribal fish and wildlife programs do, it impacts your ability to recruit and retain professional staff. Again, going back to the $200,000 grant example, it's difficult to recruit someone to come live oftentimes in very rural areas with limited services and only be able to guarantee them funding for their position for a year or two. What we often find is tribes become career stepping stones where recent graduates work for the experience and believe me, you will get the experience and then they move on after the grant ends. American Indian Alaska natives are underrepresented in the fish and wildlife profession, accounting for only 0.7% of fish and wildlife biologists. The ideal situation is for tribal members working for their tribe. Another issue with lack of staffing is that staff end up doing a lot more than what their job title is, are other duties as assigned. Just a, just a side note, be careful of that in a job description. <laughs> uh, many tribal fish and wildlife programs also serve as an emergency management team. We've seen during the pandemic that staff are, these staff are assisting with testing efforts, food distribution, and much more. And it's a bit of a double-edged sword because you definitely will get experience in a vast array of areas, but it doesn't mask the real need for more professional staff. With underfunding and lack of capacity, it can be difficult for tribes to be represented in not national conversations. Tribes own or influence the manage of nearly 140 million acres. This includes more than 730,000 acres of lakes and, and reservoirs, 10,000 miles of streams and rivers, and 18 million acres of forests. These lands and waters provide habitat for fish and wildlife, including more than 500 species listed as threatened or endangered. There are 574 federally recognized tribes as of 2022 in the United States. They're all unique. Yes, we share some similarities, but we have differences. We have tribes that own zero land. Many of our California tribes have very small land ownership. Then we have tribes in the Great Plains and the Southwest with millions of acres. My reservation, the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation is 2.8 million acres with about half being tribal. The largest land base is the Navajo Nation with over 17 million acres in four states. Because of the various acts of Congress, a lot of tribes have checkerboarded reservations. When the reservations were opened up to homesteaders and land sold and placed in deeded status, you got a checkerboard looking map. This adds another layer of complexity when managing hunting and fishing. If you're really ambitious, you can also review the hunting, fishing, subsistence land status in Alaska. And you have different land statuses. For example, you might have tribal trust lands or lands that are held in trust for the tribe by the federal government. There are also individual allotments that were lands allotted to Native Americans individually under the Dawes Act of 1887. There are deeded lands that may be owned by non-natives, the tribe, or individual Native Americans that are subject to taxes. Then to further complicate things, you have tribes like the Turtle Mountain Tribe that have public domain lands, parcels of land outside of the reservation across three states to accommodate their population at the time of the Dawes Act. And then there are the border tribes, and by that, I mean international borders. Two dozen Native American tribes live along the US-Mexico border. The Mohawk, Confederate Salish Kootenai and Blackfeet nations live along the Canadian border and numerous territories with international crossings in Alaska on the Bering Sea, Pacific Ocean and Beaufort Sea. And land status is constantly changing with more lands being taken into trust status and tribes purchasing more lands. As previously stated, tribes have been coexisting with their fish and wildlife and natural resources for time immemorial. Many of the traditional teachings center around fish and wildlife and natural resources. It's important when dealing with tribes understand tribal fish and wildlife programs run the entire spectrum. 
The Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe Game, Fish, and Parks Department began in 1935 with the tribe issuing fur bearer licenses under their newly formed constitution. And many formal programs were established after Public Law 93638. As, and as new tribes gain federal recognition, we have some at the very beginning stages of, of development. So as well as longevity, the complexity of programs is, is also from one conservation officer or licensing agent to programs with over 50 employees in multiple divisions, including research, culture preservation, eagle sanctuaries, and even the Navajo Zoo. Given there are 367 treaties and multiple executive orders and court decisions, you can understand that the authorities or jurisdiction is just as interesting. And some tribes maintain off-reservation hunting and fishing rights based on treaties. And even as recently as 2019, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of off-reservation hunting and fishing treaty rights with Herrera versus Wyoming. There are tribes that have formed commissions to help manage their collective resources, as well as maintain their treaty rights on and off the reservations. The first of these was a Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission established due to the United States versus Washington or the Bolt decision that reaffirmed the tribe's treaty reserved fishing rights and recognized them as natural resource co-managers with the state of Washington with an equal share of the harvestable number of salmon returned annually. Nifwick is made up of 20 treaty tribes in Western Washington. The Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission was established in 1977 after several court cases and legislative actions began to reaffirm the tribe's treaty fishing rights. The four treaty tribes, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Spring Reservation of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation and the Nez Perce Tribe formed CRIFIC and to, to provide coordination and technical assistance to tribes in regional, national, and international efforts to ensure that treaty fishing uh, rights issues are resolved in a way that guarantees the continuation and restoration of tribal fisheries into perpetuity, uh, perpetuity, sorry. Uh, the Great Lakes Indian Fisheries Wildlife Commission was formed in 1984, and it represents 11 Ojibwe tribes in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan who reserved hunting, fishing, and gathering rights in the 1837, 1842, and 1854 treaties with the United States. They provide natural resource management, expertise, conservation enforcement, legal and policy analysis and public information services in support of the exercise of treaty rights during well-regulated off-reservation seasons throughout the treaty ceded territories. The 1854 Treaty Authority is an intertribal natural resource management organization that protects and implements off-reservation hunting, fishing and gathering rights for the Grand Portage and Boise Forty tribes and bands in the land ceded to the United States government under the Treaty of La Pointe, 1854. And the most recent commission is the Southwest Tribal Fisheries Commission, formed in 2002 in response to the closure of the Mescalero National Fisheries Hatchery and decreased funding. The Southwest Tribal Fisheries Coalition is, is a coalition of 18 tribes in the Southwest, which seeks to assist tribal fisheries programs. It is not based on off-reservation treaty fishing rights. Despite the limitation, tribes are a vital part of fish and wildlife sustainability and conservation. And they're being recognized more and more as valuable and knowledgeable co contributors to overall restoration, conservation, and management of fish and wildlife species. From the salmon work done by the Northwest and Alaska tribes to the restoration of countless tribal bison herds throughout Indian country. Tribes are vital to the overall recovery and protection efforts of many endangered and threatened fish and wildlife species. The Blackfooted ferret has found success on many tribal lands in South Dakota and Arizona. The White Mountain Apache tribe in Arizona have been crucial in the Mexican Wolf Reintroduction Project that is managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Arizona and New Mexico State Game Fish, and USDA Forest and APHIS. The Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in North Carolina are working with three endangered species, the Eastern Hellbender or Juwa in Cherokee, per my friend Caleb Hickman. They are also working to restore several bat species and the Carolina Northern Flying Squirrel. The latter two are mentioned in the Cherokee story of the first stickball games, teaching about inclusion and how to respect the underdog. The Columbia River Basin tribes are working to ensure Pacific lamprey, a culturally important species, as well as your traditional food source is available for future generations. Tribes are also influential in innovative ways to coexist with fish and wildlife. The Confederate Salish Kootenai tribe in Montana led and directed efforts to achieve wildlife and wetland mit mitigation for the reconstruction of the main highway route through the center of their reservation. This resulted in 43 wildlife underpass crossing structures and one large overpass named the Animals Bridge on US Highway 93. 
The Colville Confederate tribe and other Northwest tribes are using the salmon cannon, pictured in the top right, to help restore salmon to their native waters in the upper Columbia. Tribes are also on the forefront front of climate change and adaptability work. Glyphwick, uh, the Great Lakes Fisheries and Indi Indian Wildlife Commission has a climate change program and have a vulnerability assessment integrating traditional ecological knowledge interviews. They and other tribes are developing seed banks in response to climate change. The Kirk tribe of California recently released their climate adaptation plan detailing climate impacts and their strategies. Tribes are working throughout the United States with the Federal Climate Adaptation Science Centers as well. Bottom line, fish and wildlife do not respect the very detailed political boundaries established over the past 200 plus years. Tribes wanna protect their natural resources from invasive species and wildlife diseases, such as chronic waste and disease, feral hogs and Northern pike. Again, tribes are attempting to combat these threats with very limited staff and funding. Tribes are creative and inclusive, some examples include youth initiative projects in the Northwest to remove Northern Pike. There have been funding opportunities for chronic waste and disease surveillance, but unfortunately, these are not annual appropriations and usually competitive grants. And despite this map on the left, where it shows like all the uh, chronic waste and disease positive deer stop at reservation boundaries, it is still a, a very um, impactful disease to tribal lands. The Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians have done trapping and removal efforts of feral hogs, and these are just a few examples. NAFWS recognizes the extreme threats invasive species and wildlife disease pose to natural resources, and we've actually dedicated our 2022 national conference to both. Here's my forestry slide. So the Intertribal Timber Council uh, was, is a nonprofit that was started in 1976, and they work to promote social, economic, and ecological values while protecting and utilizing forest, soil, water, and wildlife. And one of the, the things that they're working on is a Tribal Forest Protection Act, and this actually expands the 638 authority to, for, to the Forest Service. Unfortunately, there's no funding to go with that, so they have the authority to contract, but no funding to support tribes. And they also do the, uh, participate in the Indian Forest Management Assessment Team, where they do 10-year periodic assessments of Indian forest lands. And I suggest you look at their um, webpage, itcnet.org, for more information on them. They do a lot of great work. So I've been asked more than once in this position to give the Indigenous perspective or explain how tribes feel. And these are just not questions I can answer. It really boils down to relationship building and getting to know your neighbors and your partners. It's been said many times, if you work with one tribe, you know one tribe. And we often hear, well, we reached out to tribes, but they didn't hear back. Well, remember to keep in mind, tribes have varying levels of capacity. And often it's not that tribes are not interested or not doing the work, it's that they have been historically left out of the conversation and the funding opportunities. Also, there's a lack of understanding on how to engage tribes in conversations. It's important to take into account some of the challenges tribes deal with and understand that silence is not apathy. I've discussed lack of capacity. Imagine being a one person department. The reality is sometimes it's hard to get fish and wildlife priorities to the top of your tribal government's list, especially now when tribal leaderships are dealing with human health issues on a daily basis. Another factor to consider is state and tribal relations. Some tribes work hand in hand with states and have cooperative manage agreements and even some cross deputization of officers, while others just do not play well together. And if you're in a room with tribes that don't work well with states and you advise them to go to the state for assistance, you may not be asked back. An example of an issue would be contradicting management plans. Tribes may be managing for subsistence hunting, making sure the population is growing is large enough to support every tribal member, whereas the state may be managing based on depredation complaints and trying to decrease the population. Fire is another good example where tribal and federal state policy may differ. Tribes have used fire as a management tool forever, and the fire suppression model is contradictory to what they have been taught. You wanna make sure that you connect with the right person. Many first attempts at tribal engagement go directly to the president or chairman of the tribe. And while that's not wrong, it just takes a while for it, for it to trickle down to the person that's actually doing the management or field work, and then more time for it to go back up through the tribal process to get an answer. So you really wanna to get to know the tribe you're working with, with and be patient. And I really think it's important to meet people where they are. Ask them what is preventing them from participating. Develop that solid relationship to truly work as equal partners. 
These relationships can't be based on information and extraction from tribes and tribal professionals only. There should be a benefit for tribes as well. Many tribes I work with describing as for input, but not being included in the final outcome. Now to better show you a, a lack of the, the understanding, I'm going to show a short video on, short video of former president George W. Bush responding to a question about, oh, wait, I'm gonna have to stop that. Responding to a question about tribal sovereignty. Good morning. My name is Mark Trahant. I'm the editorial page editor of the Seattle Post Intelligencer and a member of the Native American Journalists Association. <laughs> Most school kids learn about government in the context of city, county, state, and federal. And of course, tribal governments are not part of that at all. Mr. President, you've been a governor and a president, so you have a unique experience looking at it from two directions. What do you think tribal sovereignty means in the, in the 21st century, and how do we resolve conflicts between tribes and the federal and state governments? Yeah. Uh, tribal sovereignty means that. It's sovereign. I mean, you're a, you're a, you've been given sovereignty, and you're viewed as a sovereign entity. And therefore, the relationship between the federal government and tribes is one between sovereign entities. Poor George. I think they caught him off guard there. Whoops. Hold on. <laughs> okay. So in the Lakota culture, we plan for seven generations and that means our children's, 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 et cetera. So I actually get really excited when I think about the future of tribal fish and wildlife management. Every time I hear of tribes exercising their sovereignty or winning Supreme Court cases, affirming their sovereignty, I see it as a win for all of Indian country. The NAFWS has hosted the Native American youth uh, at our National Environmental Awareness Summer Youth Practicum since the early 1990s. And seeing our youth connect with environment, is, it's very rewarding. We are also seeing more Native American and Alaska Natives achieve college degrees, and many of our NAFWS members are the first in their family and their tribe to obtain higher education. Sean Grassel from the Lower Brule Bru Sioux Tribe in South Dakota was the tribe's first PhD graduate. As those numbers continue to rise, I believe so will tribal presence. The NAFWS was founded with the intent to build network, and I'm encouraged by the number of true partnerships we have and to continue to build for tribal fish and wildlife professionals. We all know when working with natural resources, we must work together. I'm also optimistic about funding, maybe for the first time in my career. I mentioned tribes efforts to amend Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson funds over the years. And as you can imagine, states usually did not support that. However, this has seemed to change with Recovering America's Wildlife Act. For the first time to my knowledge, tribes were included at the beginning, not an add on after. And also tribes have state support, in fact, the Arizona Game and Fish Commission and the South Dakota Game, Fish and Parks have both issued resolutions of support for tribal inclusion and funding. And the tribes and the state of Washington have sent a joint letter of support. The National Wildlife Federation and NAFWS have been working together along with the Tribal Coalition to support recovering, which would be 97.5 million for tribes, annual dedicated secure funding. And this will really be a game changer for tribes. And while a pandemic and election slowed us, I'm still confident we will see this happen. Also, the Tribal Wildlife Corridors Act will promote landscape scale planning and conservation for wildlife migration pathways to boost biodiversity and safeguard our nation's fish and wildlife. It authorizes a Tribal Corridors Grant Program with $50 million to ensure tribes have resources needed for the on the ground implementation. Mutake Oasi is a common Lakota phrase that means all my relations. And we believe we are related or connected to everything which is, is common with indigenous people. However, I, ho I hope now you have a better understanding that tribes are not identical and that there are 574 unique 
federally recognized tribes and that we look different, we talk different. We don't all have casinos and per capita payments. Um, we are on the plains, the tundra, the oceans, the Everglades, the forests, the deserts, the lakes, and the cities. But we are still here. I just want to thank um, thank everybody that helped put this pro this PowerPoint together and this presentation. And I really hope that you now have a better understanding of tribal lands and their management. And as I stated before, I'm constantly learning um, on the incredible this incredibly vast topic. But I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Julie. We appreciate that very much. Um, Connor, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to field questions for us. Yeah, if folks want to type something in the chat, I'm happy to read that to Julie. Otherwise, you can just go ahead and unmute and ask a question if you feel comfortable doing that. Hopefully everybody's not sleeping. <laughs> I've got, uh, there's one question in the chat here asking how can universities serve indigenous peoples? Well, I, th I think, you know, um, access to education and funding are, are important. And also just having those support systems places for, for Native people to go to a lot of times they're first generation students maybe not so it might not be so common as now but also there's just you have to kind of allow for some of the the cultural differences uh, I worked in academics for a while and I'll tell you one of the first things I did when I came to work was look at the obituaries and not to be morbid but I was looking to see uh, if any of my students relatives had passed because uh, if I didn't see them if they had lost somebody they might be gone for four or five days and I, you have to understand that that's important that there are still cultural ties um, that tr that tribal people have and, and making acceptance for that. And, and um, also just being supportive and helping connect them and uh, not, not expecting them to be representative of every indigenous person and have, you know, have the answer to how it works everywhere because they're still individual people. There's another one in the chat here. Are there any efforts underway to allow bears to move back into the Black Hills? If so, how do you see this process moving forward? And I apologize wow. if my dog's witching hours, so there's probably oh. going to be barking. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm I'm not sure if there's any like reintroduction efforts, but we have we've had some bears, especially during the pandemic in South Dakota. We saw some bears in northeastern South Dakota. There was one here out in the plains, kind of randomly. Uh, there was some near Wind Cave, so I'm not really um, I'm not really familiar with the exact specifics on that, but um, I, you know, I'm sure that there would be the public outcry of fear would be my first gut reaction, but um, I'm not aware of any uh, specifics on that. I'll jump in um, and just ask Julie how things are going with uh, work in Alaska. I know you were looking to um, increase support and capacity there. Are you making headway there? We are. We actually received the uh, BIA Tribal Climate Resilience Grant for the Alaska region. So we are hiring um, a senior tribal climate resilience liaison to work uh, with the climate adaptation centers through USGS and also through the University of Alaska and Fairbanks and, Air and Anchorage. Uh, then we'll be hiring two more. We will also have an intern 
we've been able to uh, bring on a contractor that can kind of help us. He, he works in Alaska, he's from Alaska, um, and been able to kind of help guide us and, and help us connect with the right people. And uh, we've made some really good connections with some of the resource commissions and trying to better understand what we can do to be of service. So I feel like we're making we're making some headway and and hopefully, you know, they're seeing NAFWS as as a valuable uh, organization to their needs. Steve, you can go ahead and unmute if you want to ask your question. Go for it. Okay, great. Julie, uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, I think you mentioned in, in your presentation some, some of the important uh, court cases, Supreme Court cases that have affected tribes. And, and I, I know there was one, uh, well, relatively recently, uh, Herrera versus Wyoming, that actually turned out to be really favorable for tribes in terms of reinforcing uh, treaty hunting and fishing rights. Are, are you aware of any um, pending cases working through the courts uh, related to tribal hunting and fishing rights or treaty rights in general at this time? Uh, not, I mean, McGirt in, in Oklahoma, which reestablished basically all of Eastern Oklahoma is still reservation, but um, you know, that's, I don't know how that's gonna play out as far as what that means on the ground. I have seen, we have seen more uh, uh, Oklahoma tribes trying to do some hunting it like you might have seen Cherokee uh, purchase some land I believe and, and yep. had their first hunt for members um, I'm not I, I seems like there was another case in Montana but I'm not sure I will tell you that the state South Dakota state legis uh, one of the the legislators from Rosebud introduced a um, legislation this past week to basically open up all of South Dakota to any tribal member to hunt anywhere and uh, it failed 11 to two. I think the two tribal members voted yes, but um, I think there is becoming more, I think there is becoming more recognition of, of the off reservation rights. But I think, you know, along the same lines and Steve, you know this, but along the same lines of state and tribal relations, people kind of always wanna know why, why some tribes can't work or they don't work with states. Well, we're constantly like in court reaffirming and like, having our treaties and our, our laws tested. So I think that that's hard to build a relationship on when, when you don't have that kind of equal um, understanding. So I, I'm not really, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't have any off the top of my head. I'm, I'm sure there are some, but uh, yeah, Herrera versus Wyoming was a, was a big, a big win for Indian country. Yeah. Here in Colorado, we are um, what, one of what I think is probably the few tribes that has a, a relatively good working relationship with the state of Colorado. But, but um, I agree with your comments earlier. There's definitely a lot of, lot of tribes out there that, that just don't see eye to eye with their uh, state partners, I guess. Yeah. It's fortunate. Yeah, and, and, and some that are working hand in hand, co-managing and like I said, cross deputization, the whole, the whole gamut. So it just really depends on where you're at. Thank you. I've got another question. Uh, could you address how the legal but unfunded ability of the Forest Service to be contracted by tribes might work? I think it needs some funding to work, honestly. Um, it's, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, one of the things with the 638 contract is you get the funding, the tribe gets the funding to do those services. So if a tribe contracts one of the programs, um, I forget what the F stands for, functions, uh, deliverables or actions, I believe those are the PFDAs. If they contract one of those from one of the federal um, agencies, the funding comes with it. And so it's hard to contract something when you already don't have the money to, or the capacity, it's hard to contract something and take on zero dollars with it. So I think it really has to have some funding behind it before it can truly be successful. But that's my personal opinion. Gordon, you can go ahead and ask your question. Well, it's not a question as much as a comment. I really appreciate <clears throat> Julie's overview. It's very helpful. Every time I hear Julie speak, I learn something new. I really appreciate it. 
Um, you know, this whole uh, relationship is very complicated. It's got a very un, uh, unpleasant history and a lot of complicated legal developments from the 1800s forward to today. I fundamentally believe that um, what really helps with improving the relationships or personal um, engagement at a grassroots level, you know, and I think that for those of us or those of you who are developing your career and, you know, kind of becoming an official audit professional, um, I would take every opportunity you can to meet with tribal people at all levels um, whenever you can and, and develop personal relationships. I think those personal relationships matter enormously. Um, you know, eventually that stuff filters up to the policy level. I think the bedrock for an improved condition is those personal relationships. So I encourage that, you know, there's, there's a lot of exciting work underway in the tribal wildlife management space. And I, I would encourage people to learn about it and get to know those field biologists and, and develop those relationships. Yes, and I, I, will, I, I will say that the federal partner, I mean, there are federal partnerships. It's not just the contracting, but there are federal partnerships. The federal government has a trust responsibility to tribes. So there are, there are some of those services and tribes tend to have, I think for the most part, tend to have decent partnerships with the federal government to help them in their capacity. I think we've got time to answer the question that Carol posed in the chat. How much has COVID affected tribal wildlife management given the increasing number of wildlife species that can contract and carry COVID? How might that affect tribes and tribal wildlife management? Yeah, I mean, we we were actually did a we did a report, we did kind of a round table early on. Um, because I will tell you, it was it was really kind of an eerie feeling because when I started in May of 2019, I mean, we were just like things were going super fast and we were on the phone all the time and tribes reaching out and trying to reach out to tribes. And a lot of tribes, you know, they they shut down. Um, a lot of our uh, you know, a lot of our, like I said, a lot of our tribal staff are fish and wildlife. They were shifted to other duties, especially as um, food and, and talking about that as that came, um, came out, they started helping with that. Uh, studies maybe didn't happen or the research, the data didn't get collected because nobody was there. Or, you know, we've had, I had one tribe say they had, um, I think it was a turtle project or radio, um, radio project with some turtles and they hadn't collected data for a year. So you lost, you basically lost a year of research if you were doing that. Um, as far as like the increasing number of wildlife species, we've been trying, especially with the white-tailed deer, we've been trying to do as much education and outreach as we can. And I will tell you, we were on a conversation, staff and I, with one of the states and they were offering to help us do some outreach. And, and I said, well, you know, we need to be careful because we still have tribal members that do brain tanning when and, and so we, we wanna make sure we give the education and the comment from the state person was, well, they need to stop doing that. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. Like this is something that's important to them and they do culturally. So we need to figure out how they can do it safely or how they can mitigate the, the, the risk. So we've been trying to do, um, we've been trying to do a lot of, of education outreach without causing panic. You know, um, there's, it's scary. The tribes have been hit uh, exceptionally hard by COVID and uh, we, we already have a lot of issues that we're dealing with as far as health and housing and other socioeconomic issues that are sometimes present. And so this has, this has really hit tribes hard. So I think we're just trying to do as much education as we can and, and be mindful that just because we haven't heard from a tribe doesn't mean that they're not still there and they're not working. We just, you know, we've, we've got tribes that are again, have shut down and, and we haven't heard from them for a while, but we just want to be consistent with our messaging and let them know that we're here when they're ready for us and, and try to help them. Cool. Well, I think with that, we can conclude the seminar hour. I would invite everyone to tune in uh, after this to the post seminar discussion with Julie. Uh, so if you have more questions, you can move over there and ask them along with the students that are in the seminar class. Um, yeah, I think with that, thank you so much, Julie, for presenting to us. It's always fun to get a 
a very non-forestry perspective on things and to get the tribal perspective. So thank you so much. Thank you, Pilami. I 